Good morning, everybody. David Shapiro here with another video about systems thinking. So today's video is about schemas or mental blueprints. So let's get right into it. What is the definition of a schema? For the sake of this video, this is the definition that I'm using. Cogn uh, uh, schemas are, are cognitive frameworks or mental models that shape how individuals interpret, process, and respond to various elements and interactions within a system. These schemas provide uh, the guidelines for understanding complex relationships, communications, transactions, cultural norms, problem-solving approaches, and informational flow. In other words, schemas are patterns of thought, behavior, expectations, interactions, and, and reactions. Patterns, blueprints, that's the, that's the name of the game here. Okay, so relationship schemas. This is the first one of, I think, about eight or nine that we're going to go over. Relationship schemas are mental frameworks that guide expectations and behaviors in interpersonal relationships. So, for instance, expectation settings, what you can anticipate from interpersonal relationships in various contexts. This is how you relate to people and the patterns of behavior and interaction and words and how you interpret uh, you know, various uh, encounters with, uh, with people, particularly in intimate settings such as romantic partners, family, siblings, that sort of stuff. Uh, there's also behavioral patterns, such as uh, how you are supposed to act and how other people are supposed to act, uh, and the communication styles, particularly around conflict resolution or hurt feelings and that sort of thing. Uh, then there's about uh, some of those behavioral patterns are about how to react to transgressions. Uh, role definition is another part of this. And so what, what I mean by role definition is um, who's the breadwinner, who's the caregiver, who's the homemaker, that sort of thing. And there's uh, lots and lots of roles that are often um, uh, trained in by family and culture. Uh, so that's another thing to just be aware of for schemas. Uh, emotional responses. So again, uh, how you react to things, um, recognizing that you know you might have a, an emotional schema or an emotional reaction, and the other person has an emotional reaction. And uh, actually, a big part of marriage is learning to uh, recognize your schemas and their schemas and then update them so that you can better fit together. Um, adaptation and change over time. So one thing to keep in mind is that all schemas are learned. So this is a trend that you're going to see throughout this video is that all schemas are learned. There's very little about uh, your schemas that are intrinsic or innate. Um, certainly, people might have more uh, intrinsic empathy or might be more intrinsically emotional uh, emotional creatures, but those things only inform your schemas, but schemas exist at a higher level of cognition and practice and training. Communication schemas. So communication schemas are cognitive structures that shape the understanding and execution of social interactions through verbal and nonverbal means. So this is speaking, writing emails, that sort of thing. So verbal cues, these vary a lot from family to family and across cultures where, you know, whose turn is it to speak? Um, how you interpret words, what words are expected, and in what order. Uh, Nonverbal signals such as body language and facial expressions. You might notice that some cultures like uh, Russia, for, in for instance, many Russians um, are kind of very uh, short on facial expressions, whereas some other cultures are about big expressions, right? You know, the, the Latin temperament. So Spanish, Italian, uh, known uh, Greeks, known for big expressions. Russians, not so much. Uh, contextual understanding. So understanding uh, the, the, the context in which communication happens. Is it at home? Is it at work? Is it formal? Is it informal? Um, is it with friends? Is it with family? Uh, that sort of thing. So again, uh, communication schemas change depending on context. So that's the key thing to understand here. Conflict resolution. So this comes up again and again because most uh, schemas in terms of how we interact with each other uh, have to do a lot with uh, how you handle uh, conflict, emotions, and other uh, bad stuff that happens. Or maybe not bad stuff, we don't necessarily want to pathologize it, but difficult things that come up. And then finally, social norms such as uh, cultural and societal ex expectations about what is appropriate and effective in terms of how to communicate. So for instance, there are some cultures where you know raising your voice and gesturing and shouting are just considered default effective ways of getting your point across. One of the you know tropes that we see in movies is like you know Italians get stuck in traffic and they start yelling and you're like ah oh, you idiot or whatever and they don't really mean anything by it. Whereas you know if that were to happen somewhere else, it would might be perceived as violent. Um, so again, communication schemas uh, have to do with you know tone of voice, pitch, volume, 
um, you know, associated hand gestures, that sort of thing. And different cultures, different families, different people interpret communication schemas vastly differently. Uh, transaction schemas. So this is a very interesting one. So transaction schemas are conceptual models that outline the steps and rules involved in exchanges or interactions, often in a commercial con context, not always. Uh, so exchange rules. So exchange rules are the uh, schemas that outline uh, the guidelines and protocols for a successful transaction. How do you approach business? Uh, you know, do you greet people? Do you get right down to business? Do you avoid business for 15 minutes? There's all kinds of different uh, transaction uh, exchange rules around the world. Value assessment. So this is another thing. Uh, transaction schemas uh, dictate how you uh, value, judge, or assign the worth of goods, services, and information. So it, this is also going to be very geographically, uh, contextually dependent because, for instance, in Pakistan uh, or India or other places, goats have a very different uh, value <laughs> uh, schema than perhaps in America. Payment methods. Payment methods are uh, schemas that define what is acceptable in terms of money, uh, barter or, you know, mediums of exchange, that sort of thing. Because, uh, you know, you might, you might uh, in some places, it's like, no, it's just money. So, for instance, in America, we have a, like, strictly, like, money only. We don't really do trading here um, unless it's between, like, close friends. So, again, that's a schema, is you go to a store, the store is only going to accept money. Um, in other places, you go to a market, the vendor might accept a trade if you have something, you know, of equal value. Or if there's something else like, hey, you know, like... I'll clean up your kitchen for you or whatever, right? We used to do that more in America where like you could go to a library or a restaurant and say, hey, you know, give me a meal in exchange for, you know, cleaning up the cleaning up the kitchen. We don't really do that anymore, but I'm sure there's plenty of places in the world where you can do that. Trust and verification. So transaction schemas include mechanisms for verifying the legitimacy uh, of the exchange parties. So for instance, in America, we have things like Angie's List and Yelp and other things and reviews. Right. So we, we look at Google reviews in the past, you'd have to, you know, you trust word of mouth to say like, Hey, is this contractor going to screw me over or are they going to do good work? Um, in other places, well, word of mouth is pretty much universal. If there's someone that you trust and they tell you, Hey, use this guy. I trust them. I like them. Um, that is, that is pretty universal. Now, of course, with technology and the internet, we have new ways of establishing trust and legitimacy. Um, and then finally risk mitigation. Uh, so risk mitigation is about, okay, you know, how do I know that like you're going to hold up your end of the bargain? Um, in some cases, you're going to say like, hey, this needs to be a, in a contract. This needs to be, uh, you know, either verbal contract or gentleman's handshake or needs to be inked in paper. Uh, or so, for instance, another thing that's very common here in my area in America is when you hire a contractor to do something, if it's a big job, you only pay half up front. And so then you hold the other half hostage. In other places, they won't even get started until you pay them, or you don't pay them at all until the end. Uh, so again, there's a lot of these shorthands where it's like you pay half up front, you pay half later, uh, or it's you know you sign a contract that says you only get paid after this laundry list is is done and verified by a third party. That sort of thing. Cultural schemas. Cultural schemas are mental templates that influence the interpretation and understanding of events, behaviors, and norms based on cultural background. So, for instance, social norms. Social norms are cultural schemas that define what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior, particularly within uh, certain group contexts. So the picture that I have here is some Victorians at a, fa at a fancy dinner. So if you watch any kind of Regency uh, or, you know, uh, aristocratic you know, TV shows or movies, Downton Abbey was super popular, um, Bridgerton is popular now, you'll see a lot of social norms that are very, very explicit and also kind of distinct from our culture today, which is one of the reasons why we find it fascinating. Value systems. Value systems are schemas that provide a framework for considering what is morally or ethically significant. So for instance, using this example of the Victorians, a woman's chastity was considered incredibly significant. And this is a repeated theme in Bridgerton, where if a, uh, a man is allowed to sleep around, but a woman is not, and if a woman is even caught alone with a man, uh, her virtue is now suspect, and therefore um, she's considered uh, morally lowered in the eyes of her peers. Rituals and traditions. So one thing, uh, an, an example of a ritual or tradition is like, you know, ballroom dancing. But another one is... Who is allowed to talk to whom, 
particularly in aristocratic societies. You're expected to know the rank, the social rank of everyone in a room, which dictates who is allowed to approach whom or start conversations or make introductions. So that's an example, uh, an example of a social tradition. There's, of course, plenty of other social rituals out there that uh, come from cultural schemes. Uh, languages and symbols. So this is, again, goes back to communication schemes, so I don't think I need to repeat that. And then finally, worldview. So worldview is deeply embedded in culture uh, and or cultural schemes, which is how you see yourself as a member of society, but also how you see your society, your culture, in relating to the rest of the world. So in the past, during, for instance, the British Empire, the British often saw themselves as the arbiters of civilization, uh, which that changed how they related to themselves and foreigners and other people. And of course, you know, that has changed, especially with the, dis well, I guess the British Empire still exists, but it has uh, changed its station, let's say. Uh, likewise, uh, Americans, Chinese, Indian, every culture has different worldviews that are either implicit or explicit. And often they are established through um, just cultural mores, like kind of embedded. Sometimes they're explicitly talked about with uh, film, TV, and movies, that sort of thing. Problem-solving schemas. So problem-solving schemas are cognitive strategies employed for identifying, analyzing, and resolving uh, issues or challenges. So first off, the identification process. What you even recognize as a problem is a schema, and it is often taught to you by your family, society, work, or school. Uh, and so in some cases, you know, one of the age-old adages is, you know, uh, knowing what the problem is is half the battle. And so, you know, how you, how you go about identifying and categorizing uh, problems, that is a schema. And so, for instance, if you are a, uh, an electrician, the kinds of problems you are aware of and looking for are going to be electrical in nature. If you're a plumber, the kinds of problems that you're going to be aware of and looking for are pipe and water in nature. So an electrician walks into a house, they're going to look for a certain set of problems. A plumber walks into a house, they're going to look for an entirely different set of problems. So that's what I mean by identification process. Analytical methods. So again, some of this is, is, is cultural, some of this is occupational, but an analytical method is how do you break down the problem? How do you identify the scope of the problem, the boundaries of the problem, uh, the nature and significance of the problem, and the ingredients that are going to go into making that problem more solvable? Uh, solution generation. So solution generation is what approaches do you use to evaluate possible solutions? What does the solution even look like? Um, defining the goal is a really important practice in problem-solving schemas, and it, this is, again, going to vary widely depending on um, you know, the, the specific domain you're in, your occupational training. So, for instance, if you're an automobile mechanic, the solution generation, the you know the goal state is get the car running again, right? But then how do you get from where the car is now to where you're going to get to? If you're a software developer, as many of my viewers are, then the solution generation is what code do I need? What tests do I need to verify that this code works? Those are all schemas. Um, implementation steps. So again, this is a roadmap for getting from here to there. And it, this is going to vary um, from individual to individual because we all have our own kind of internal schemas that we may or may not be conscious of. And by bringing your internal schemas from unconscious or subconscious to conscious, you can, you can list out the steps that you're going to take and the decision points. A lot of people just go based on intuition, but the point of this video is to make you more conscious of the schemas that you're using because once you're conscious of them, you can list them out and you can work with them um, as a metacognitive skill. Uh, evaluation criteria. So these are the parameters for assessing the effectiveness. What is your definition of success and done? How do you know that you have succeeded? Um, so for instance, one of the schemas that I adopted a long time ago in my technology career was solve the problem permanently. <laughs> uh, my evaluation criteria was this will never be a problem again. If, it, if that uh, criteria was met, then I solved the problem, which is one of the reasons that I was top in my, my career. Information schemas. Information schemas are frameworks that help in organizing and interpreting, uh, interpreting data and information. So first is data categorization. How do you identify and organize data and information that you're receiving from the world? Do you consciously categorize it or do you just kind of let your instincts categorize it? Um, by consciously labeling data, uh, you can become a little bit more like Sherlock Holmes. And I don't know why Midjourney decided Sherlock Holmes had a top hat instead of a deerstalker, but whatever. Um, 
Search strategies. So search strategies are these, these are schemas about how you go about finding information. This is called information foraging. This is about seeking and gathering relevant information. Do you go to Google? Do you call your best friend? Do you have a library that you can, uh, you know, that you can go to and look for a book? Um, or do you go to TikTok? A lot of young people go to TikTok as part of their information foraging strategies today. Uh, source evaluation. The source evaluation is how you outline and assess the credibility, reliability, and validity of various information sources. This is also how you handle cognitive dissonance. So what I mean by that is you might say, well, I'm not going to listen to Fox News because they're conservative and they're mainstream media and they're super biased and they're corporate, you know, whatever. I'm not going to listen to the government because the government is always biased or whatever. Um, I'm not going to listen to that person, but I'm going to trust this other person. So that's what I mean by source evaluation. Information literacy is a, a part of the schema that is about how do you how do you look at specific information? How do you critically evaluate uh, and effectively use information, judging the merits of that individual piece of information, such as where it came from, does it jive with other models, that sort of thing. So developing information literacy is part of your information schema. And then finally, synthesis and application, which is how do you integrate valuable new information and then how do you use it? Emotional schemas. Emotional schemas are cognitive frameworks that influence how individuals recognize, interpret, and manage their emotions, as well as the extent to which they feel controlled by or in control of their emotional states. So, what do we mean by this? Emotion, first is emotional recognition. Uh, emotional schemas uh, are teach you about how to recognize, identify, and label your emotions. So there's a trope that is seen in all kinds of film, TV, and movies, particularly older stuff, and we're becoming more aware of this, but a lot of men are like, I don't have any emotions while they're screaming angrily. Um, and this is a schema. This is a set of beliefs about emotions where because of patriarchy and toxic masculinity, men are quote, not allowed to have emotions. And so because of, because of being emotionally stunted, many men, particularly older men, but not exclusively older men, um, are unable to identify and label their emotions because they are, uh, they, part of their schema is emotions are bad. So I'm not even going to recognize them or acknowledge them. Uh, handling methods. So part of emotional schemas is how do you respond to emotions? So there's a few general patterns of how you respond to emotion, emotions. You can nurture them by saying, hey, this is a legitimate emotion. What does it mean? This is valuable information. You might also react by ignoring them. Again, um, culturally speaking, a lot of men are conditioned to ignore emotions um, due to beliefs around them. Um, you might also indulge them. So for instance, what I mean by indulging emotions is if your emotions are particularly intense um, or you were not taught emotional regulation by your family, or in fact, you may have been taught emotional dysregulation by your family. If your parents regularly fly off the handle um, and you know just indulge in whatever anger and kind of get themselves worked up, um, that is what I mean by indulging emotions. So that's kind of like you can react positively, negatively, or distantly, or hesitantly, or whatever, suspiciously to your emotions. Um, emotional trust. So this is an um, even bigger part of your emotional schema, which is how much do you trust your emotions? Do you view them as valid sources of information, or do you view them with hostility and suspicion? Uh, and I'm not going to tell you which is the right way, but I will say that, um, <laughs> that trusting your emotions as valuable sources of information is important, but not necessarily indulging them. So one rule of thumb that I learned is emotions are always real, but they're not necessarily true because this goes back to emotional schemas and reactions where you might be programmed to react with a certain emotion, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is the correct reaction or the optimal reaction for you. And this is why I'm framing it all in the context of schemas, which schemas are learned. You can learn to react to things with different emotions. Locus of control. So locus of control is about um, where, like, you know, are, is your control internal or external? Do your emotions control you or do you control them? And of course, this is a really big theme in lots of movies, particularly the Jedi and the Sith uh, and Star Wars. The Jedi are about, I control my emotions. I am the master of myself, uh, which is based on Zen and Bushido from uh, Japanese culture. And then the Sith are about giving into their emotions and empowering their emotions and saying, uh, you know, the, 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 the Sith still want to control their emotions, but rather than, you know, uh, you know, tamp them down or, you know, be stoic about it, they use their emotions. They, they deliberately pump up their rage and their desire for control. 
And then finally, coping mechanisms, which is when the emotions are too intense or too unpleasant, how do you react to them? Again, these are about habits and beliefs and schemas. Um, some of it is internal or endogenous, which is the level of intensity or emotional sensitivity that you have might be endogenous. But then how you react to it, the coping mechanisms, these are schemas that are entirely learned. Daily schemas. So what I mean by a daily schema is these are cognitive structures that guide daily routines and behaviors in areas such as sleep, nutrition, focus, self-care, and physical activity. So sleep patterns, this has to do with uh, timing, quality, duration of sleep. Basically, how do you get ready for sleep? When do you know that it's time to go to bed? Uh, nutritional choices. So food, uh, food selection, portion size, meal timing. These are all schemas. These are patterns that are often learned um, in childhood and carried throughout life. So for instance, I am a speed eater. I eat really fast and it's very compulsive because dinner time was not a pleasant time for me growing up, <laughs> at least not always. Um, so pretty much I wanted to get away from the table as fast as possible to go be by myself, probably because I was autistic and nobody knew. And so um, sitting at the dinner table with everyone was not a pleasant time. And knowing what I know now, whenever I visit uh, friends and family that have uh, people with autism in the family, I recognize the pattern where they want to get away from the dinner table as fast as possible. So <laughs> uh, if, if I had it to do over again, I would say like, let Dave eat by himself because that's just what he prefers. Um, and then I wouldn't be a speed eater and I'm still working on unpacking that habit, but that is a schema. It is a learned pattern. Focus and productivity. So daily schema is about when, how, and where you are supposed to focus and work and concentration levels. So one thing that I recommend is that while schemas are learned, you also have to learn what is endogenous. So for me, an endogenous trait is that I have the best focus first thing in the morning. So what I do is I get up, I make my coffee, and I make my YouTube videos, and that is like that is when I do my work, and I try and be done by noon every day, um, unless I'm really excited like last night when I was making some of these slides. Uh, Self-care practices. So again, learned schemas and patterns and blueprints about things like personal grooming. When do you brush your teeth and take a shower? How do you relax? What do you do when you relax? And mental health. These are all schemas. These are just patterns and blueprints that you learn and develop over time. And then finally, exercise. What kind of exercise do you do? When do you do it? How often? How intense? Um, those sorts of things. And so one thing that's really interesting is that because there's so much information out there, people might adopt very strange uh, or unhealthy uh, beliefs and schemas around exercise. So for instance, I've known people who, um, because they were very sedentary, a little bit of exercise would cause a little bit of pain, and then they would react to that pain saying, ah, well, exercise is clearly bad for me, so I'm going to do less, which actually made them more infirm and more susceptible to pain. And so that was, they developed a schema, a set of beliefs and patterns and, uh, and behaviors around exercise that were in response to something that is actually very natural. Because if I don't exercise for a week, yeah, it's going to hurt a little bit because my body is not happy with me. But again, these are developed schemas that are learned, not necessarily endogenous. Now, the learned might be in reaction to a very real thing, such as pain, but I just want to point out that uh, be aware of the schemas that you develop and why you develop them. All right, so in conclusion, everything is based on schemas. Uh, schemas are patterns of behavior and thought. At their core, they are just blueprints. They are blueprints and patterns that shape our, our entire lives. Um, understanding the universality of schemas, uh, how you relate to yourself, uh, all the people in your life, how you guide your life, how you uh, engage in your patterns and habits all day, every day, uh, even, even the, the course of your life. Um, can come down to schemas, which I didn't address here, but like midlife crisis and, you know, career progression. These are also all cultural schemas. Self-awareness. The whole point of this video is to develop more self-awareness about your schemas, my schemas, because the more aware you are of schemas, the more you have access to them and you can change them. So let me give you a story about this. Why, like pretty much the inspiration for this video is I've been collaborating with like professional academics, which because I am not an academic, I was never trained or indoctrinated into um, the communication schemas that uh, professional researchers uh, use. And so I have been learning like, okay, the way that I approach email, the way that I approach uh, disagreements uh, is based on, you know, certain schemas and experiences, but the way that they, uh, that the researchers that I work with approach uh, disagreements and uh, that sort of thing is very different. 
And so then I'm recognizing, ah, I had a different schema than from them. And it's rather than pathologizing, saying I'm right, they're wrong, or they're right, I'm wrong, just recognizing that there are different schemas and so that I can then develop and cultivate new schemas, which is just more tools in my toolbox. And so this goes to understanding others, which is once you recognize that a lot of the way that people relate to the world and you and each other, it all comes down to schemas, whether it's negotiation or whatever else. So for instance, um, in, uh, in uh, many Middle Eastern cultures, uh, it, basically everything is a negotiation. Everything is haggling and barter. And so this is something that's really kind of bewildering to a lot of particularly Americans, um, having worked on many uh, global teams. I will say that one of the most confusing things about working with Middle Easterners and uh, Indians uh, at first is that a lot of things are, neg- are negotiations where the, based on like every interaction with a stranger, they feel like they believe that someone has to win and someone has to lose because it is, it is a te- there is intrinsic tension, whereas we Americans really just want the transaction to be as fast as possible. So we prioritize different things. So that's what I mean by understanding others. And so it's like, you know, I remember one time that I was going in to negotiate with um, someone who was an Indian and I just recognized that he was operating by that schema. And so I was like, this is what I want. This is what I want you to do. And like, I just, I changed my tone of voice and treated it like it was a negotiation, like it was haggling. And he was happy to like roll with that, that pattern. But you wouldn't use that with say a Japanese person because Japanese people are more about propriety, respect, and whoever is senior in the interaction. So understanding different cultural schemas uh, is a good way to move through the world. And then finally, as I have said many times, schemas are dynamic and evolving. They are not static. They are all learned. Now, you might you might have learned them in childhood. You might have learned them in reaction to uh, pain, hunger, and you know emotional sensitivity, or any number of other things that are endogenous. But just remember that your endogenous traits, the things that come from within your organism, Um, They influence the schemas and how you react to them. But if you bring those schemas from unconscious to conscious, you can say, oh, yeah, the reason that I learned that pattern is because I am reacting to a certain kind of pain or a certain kind of memory or a certain kind of hunger or some other need or internal stimuli that is not necessarily – it doesn't have to control your schemas, but it it definitely can influence your schemas. And you need to work with your underlying – Uh, physical needs and emotional needs. I'm not saying that, oh, a schema, you can just paper over and adopt any schema that you want. Um, That's not exactly what I'm saying, but they're not fixed. They're not static. So that's the key takeaway. Thanks for watching. I hope you got a lot out of this video. Like, subscribe, and share. And uh, yeah, enjoy your schemas. Cheers.